righty. So, as Declan mentioned, in a former life, uh, before I chose the oh-so-very-noble calling of writing business books, I worked in the equally noble calling of writing speeches for politicians. Uh, and because of that experience as a political speechwriter, people often ask me, Dan, what makes a good speech? And I've thought about that question a lot over the last 10 years, which is my new marker for everything. And um, I have discovered that good speeches in general, and good speeches on Friday afternoons at 5 p.m. on the heels of two full days in particular, uh, always have three key ingredients, three key elements in any good speech, anywhere, anytime, any country, any language, any topic. Three essential ingredients. They are brevity, levity, and repetition. Let me say that again. <laughs> Brevity, <laughs> levity, and repetition. So I'm going to try to be reasonably brief. I'm going to try not to be too, too severe and serious about it all. Um, and I'm going to try to repeat the important stuff over and 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 over again until you want to scream. Now, here's what I want to do during our, our relatively short time together. I sort of, uh, it's, it's, it's a nice kind of... Uh, a compliment, I think, to Richard's presentation. What I want to do is I want to talk about success um, in a more kind of um, uh, economic way. I want to talk about, I want to make an argument to you about the economy and about how uh, these, the traits that Richard was talking about are really habits of the heart. I think they make perfect sense to me. What I want to talk to you about is sort of into what sphere should you deploy these habits of the heart and make an argument to you about how the abilities, the skills, not the habits of the heart, but the abilities, the capabilities, the cognitive capacities that used to matter the most still matter but matter less, and a different set of abilities matters more. So I want to make to you a big picture contextual argument about what's going on in the economies of most of the Western countries, uh, certainly Japan, certainly um, Australia. And I want to begin... Um, by telling you about the biggest mistake I ever made. I want to sort of get into this economic argument by telling you about the biggest mistake I ever made. And that occurred roughly 20 plus years ago when in a moment of youthful indiscretion, I decided to go to law school. Now, in the United States, law school is a professional school. It's a, you go to university and then you go on to uh, graduate school. Um, in my case, to study law. And in the United States, we have this very peculiar institution of class rank. That is, we look at people's marks and we stack them up. Um, so you can be in the top 5% of your class. I wasn't there. Top 10% of your class. Wasn't there. Top 20% of your class. Wasn't there. Uh, I actually ended up graduating in the part of my law school class that made the top 90% possible. Um, now, it turned out, happily enough for me, as someone who ended up spending part of his professional life looking at the link between educational attainment and performance in labor markets, it turned out, ironically enough, that law school, more than anything I've done in my life, dramatically, profoundly, I would argue, permanently, permanently increased my earning power. Because in law school, I met my wife. Otherwise, it was a total loss. I, I really was. I graduated massively in debt, thanks to the peculiar way we finance higher education in the U.S. I never practiced law a day in my life. If I could press the rewind button, live that part of my life over again, I would in a flash. All of which raises a question, which I think because it's the end of two long days, I will toss out to you, which is this. If it was such a colossal error, if I'm up here saying that this was the biggest mistake he ever made. What do you think the forces were impelling me to do that in the first place? What do you think was driving me to do that in the first place? What do you, just shout out an answer. Expectations. Expectations? Who else has an answer? Acceptance. Say that again. Acceptance? Yeah. Somebody's, somebody in the middle is shouting out your mother, and I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt that he's answering the question. Um, and, and if he... Um, <laughs> And if he is, he's half right. Yes. Like, well, that's, that's what I thought at first. Like most things in life, this colossal mistake was really my parents' fault. Um, 
I say that actually as a, as a son and as a father. Um, but actually, the more I spend my time um, studying organizations, studying people at work, the more you one realizes the power of context, that we don't make decisions, we don't carry out behaviors in a vacuum. We do it in a context. We do it in the context of, in some ways, our own personal narrative. We do it in the context of the organization in which we work. We do it in the context of our nationality. We do it in the context of the historical moment that we inhabit. And when I was a kid, and just to lay out the context, I, you know, I grew up um, in a middle class family. I grew up, I was explaining to someone at lunch today, he said, oh, I'm not that well versed in, um, in US geography. And I said, well, you know that there's New York and Washington and Miami on one side, and, and San Francisco and Los Angeles on the other side. And then there's this whole part that people fly over. That's where I'm from. Uh, I'm, in fact, from a town that there's no way you would have heard of, a town called Columbus, Ohio. Um, which, again, the best way to, when I was growing up, Columbus, Ohio was an absolute hotbed of social rest. It was the most kind of um, <laughs> quintessentially kind of middle class, middle brow place that you can imagine. And that's the context, and I want to sort of talk about that context, because in that sort of context, talking basically the final third of the 20th century in advanced economies, the context that I grew up in was very much the context of all advanced economies. And the context yielded a certain um, recipe, certain uh, uh, formula of parental advice. And the advice went like this. Um, get good marks at school, go to university if you could, and then pursue a profession that's going to give you some amount of economic security. So if you're a kid like me and you're pretty good at English, maybe you go on and study law. If you're better at maths and the hard sciences, maybe you go become an engineer, maybe you go to medical school. Um, if, you know, blood grosses you out, your verbal skills are a little shaky, you could always go back in that era and become an accountant. Um, and if you think about those kinds of professions here for a moment, the, the engineers, lawyers, accountants, it was those kind of professions. If you made it into one of those professions, you had a very solid foothold in the middle class. Not only in the U.S., not only in the U.K., but basically throughout Western Europe, in Japan and in Australia, in the entire advanced economies. And if you take two steps back, and think about the, any kind of profession, any kind of industry. It was those sorts of abilities, those lawyer, engineer, accountant kind of abilities that mattered most. Those were the abilities that, that organizations wanted. Therefore, individuals were incentivized to develop those abilities. And we had this whole apparatus, this very elaborate apparatus, starting in you know, uh, pre-primary school, from primary school to secondary school, into university, into professional schools, into firms themselves to try to inculcate those kinds of abilities, those lawyer, accountant, engineer abilities. Well, my argument here today is that those kinds of abilities still matter, absolutely, but they matter less. And a different set of abilities matters more. And it's a set of abilities that in many advanced economies we haven't taken seriously enough. Um, and here's how I want to explain it. This is where it's helpful to be a writer. I'm a writer, and if you ever want to annoy a writer, um, one of the best things, one of the best ways to annoy a writer, or one of the best ways to annoy me at least, is to tell a writer that a picture is worth a thousand words. <laughs> I hate that. I hate that. I mean, it's not wrong, it's just, it is irritating. 